Good morning. Good morning. That's better. How are you all doing today? My name is Bob Rasmussen. I'm one of the elders here at Groton Bible Chapel, and I'm going to be continuing our fruitful sermon series on peace. Uh, two weeks ago, we heard Jason Wallace talk on love, and last week we heard Devin talk on joy, and so I'm going to continue along. As a disclaimer, um, I don't know why I was chosen for this position, for peace. Um, if you know me well, that's kind of not my forte. Um, I tend to be uh, argumentative, and I love conflict. It somehow enthuses me. And oh, by the way, for the record, uh, and an aside, I actually wasn't slated for this position. The uh, person, I'm not going to say names, but um, they were slated for this, and then they went on vacation, or had to go on vacation of some sort. But I will tell you that that person is in this room today. <laughs> so, if you want to know who it is, come see me but I will protect your name. So, what is peace? I'm going to define it in a couple ways. Uh, first, I think maybe a more generic term of what we would see as peace day in and day out in earth, on this, in this world, and that would be earthly peace. I kind of split up between earthly peace and spiritual peace. So, in any good sermon prep, I said, well, what does peace even mean? Let's go to Webster's Dictionary. So I looked, and peace is defined as a freedom from civil disturbance, a state of concord or tranquility, freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts. So in looking at that, I noticed that there's a lot of words like freedom and then from bad things, right? Freedom from dis dis uh, civil disturbance, from concord, uh, state of concord or tranquility, freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts. So we see that peace is really like an absence of conflict as defined in the dictionary. So I was thinking about it more, and I said, well, what other things in my life do I see as peace, or do other people view as a peaceful thing? So on the screen, you might see some of these things, and we might relate to the peace sign, the peace sign, a dove, which is biblical, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, stones stacked on each other. I don't get this one. I chose it because you see this a lot, and it goes with all that PC stuff. Which, by the way, I read an article, stacking rocks is like a thing now, and it actually does not help our national parks, and it's like bad for the erosion and whatever. So stop doing it. <laughs> it's not peaceful, trust me. So you might look at peace as maybe an event in your life, um, uh, maybe a significant event. I picked this one. Um, you may know what this is. Hopefully most of you in this room do. It's what? Right, so the falling of the Berlin Wall in November of 89. Um, this is a peaceful time, or a, or a mark of peace maybe in your mind, or the minds of the world, when communism fell in Germany, and subsequently in the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, or, if you're a lot older in the room, and I'm not going to call Willie Delane out as being really old, so <laughs> I won't use his name, but if you remember this picture, and who knows what this might be, I think I heard it, right? So the signing of the peace treaty from when Japan surrendered to us in September of 45 in Tokyo Bay on the back of the USS Missouri, right? A big time of peace in our world when World War II was over. So we hear and see that peace in our pop culture and in what we live, or live is a place where there's no conflict or where you're truly happy. But I want to jump into what spiritual peace is. What is spiritual peace? Well, let's start by defining it in our dictionary, the Bible. And go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, which talks on the fruits of the Spirit. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So that last section of the, uh, those verses, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. See, the fruit of the Spirit is not ours. Um, it's not a spiritual gift in the sense that it's one of our talents being used for God. But the fruit of the Spirit can be seen in our lives because Christ lives in us, and it's really just a reflection of 
Christ inside of us. This is a fundamental truth of what the fruit of the Spirit actually is. And if you don't know what that means to have Christ in your life, um, come see me, come see someone who brought you today, because that's a really important thing to be able to know Jesus as your personal Savior. But we're going to talk today from the vantage point of Christ is in our lives. Continuing on in the Bible, John 16.33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. So if we look at this verse, this kind of doesn't align with the dictionary version, right? We see the word suffering, and but be courageous, so it's okay. So it's like, oh, Jesus, what are you saying? There's going to be suffering in this world. So let's continue on. John 14, 27, Jesus is speaking again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. So we see it again. We see that there's trouble, there's fear, but he's saying, don't be troubled, don't be fearful because of me. So for spiritual peace, how can we better define it in our own lives? Um, For me, on a personal note, I had a a small painting um, above my bed when I was a little kid. The the painting's uh, titled Christ My Pilot. And this, to me, defines what peace truly is. It's a storm around this boy sailing a ship, and Jesus has his arm on his shoulder, right? So there is conflict. There's turmoil around him, but he's at peace because of Christ with him. Maybe another definition for you might be a hurricane. You're like, huh? (laughs) Get there. So a hurricane, hundreds of miles wide, nasty storm, whipping winds, lots of flooding, but in the center is a small little eye. And in that eye, it's kind of nice, kind of peaceful. There's an account by a man named James Riley um, who wrote out Hurricane Irma in 2017, which you remember was a Category 5 hurricane that pretty much uh, decimated the west coast of Florida coming up through the Keys and stuff. And he, his account is this. He said, standing in the eye of Irma was pretty incredible. It only took a few minutes to go from roaring craziness to a very surreal calm. The sun was out. There was only the gentlest, gentlest of breezes, sensationally warm, and surrounded by downed trees. Huge pieces of metal roofs and people who were clearly shell-shocked. It was almost like a Salvador Dali painting that had come to life, and in an almost good way. But we all knew that this surreal environment would not last for more than a short time. We also knew that when it had got bad again, it would be worse. You see, Dr. Dave Reed, I think, coined it best. And he defined spiritual peace as the calmness of confidence in God. The calmness of confidence in God. And you can further draw this out to, in order to truly experience God's peace, we need to experience conflict. So I want to pose three questions to you today. First one, do I want peace in my life? The second one is, how do I get peace? And the third is, what do I do with peace? So you might be saying, what do you mean, do I want peace in my life? Of course I do. That's the most the stupidest thing ever. Yeah, I also thought that too. But um, no, so I, when I was thinking about this question, do I really want peace in my life? And, and the answer is not really, not all the time. Why is that? Well, as I told you, I like conflict and arguing and ask my wife. Um, but that's my flesh. My fleshy desires want me to be in conflict constantly, but God calls me to show his peace. And in reality, what am I really showing to my adversaries in those times of conflict? And it's not Christ. You see, peace is a promise. It's not a deliverance. So I ask myself, do I truly want God to deliver me from my strife, or do I want him to work through me during those times? In other words, do I want to be delivered from my problems, or do I want a deliverer? See, God can use the opportunities I'm in to teach me a valuable lesson. This lesson can't be learned if God removes those struggles from my life every time. We're going to turn to Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, don't worry about anything. But in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, it's God's peace that is beyond our comprehension that says, I'll take care of you, that you're okay. So second question, how do I get peace? How do you get peace in your life? Psalm 29, 11 says, the Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Well, we see right there that peace is a blessing from the Lord. So long as we're his children, right? That he blesses us with his peace. There's no, no true peace apart from Christ. He is the Prince of Peace, the one who gives us peace. If we don't know Christ, then we don't know peace. I think our fledgling attempts to grasp peace the way the world does, whether it's through rock piling, meditation, yoga, Pilates. Am I saying things that are, yeah. So those types of things that we try and seek peace through, through, the, through the world, will ultimately fail us um, because they don't give us true peace, but God does. When I know the peace given and have his spirit in me, the peace that passes understanding will inevitably emanate through me because he isn't in me, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit in me. And I'm going to use the analogy that Jason Wallace used um, a few weeks ago. He said, when he was talking about love, he said, love inside of us is a light bulb that's on, right? If we have Christ in our lives, that light bulb's on, but it's the muck and the mire that's around it that we have to kind of clean off to let it emanate from us. Well, I'll challenge you today that you should be thinking about that analogy every week because the fruit of the Spirit, each one, is like that light bulb that's on in us if we know Christ as our Savior. You see, our peace is there. We have access to it, but to feel at peace requires action on our part. It's kind of like strapping on the sandals of peace, right? We know in Ephesians 6, 17, where it talks about the armor of God, that the sandals are of peace. So... I say to myself, I'm not an observer of peace, but a doer. Just like shoes are an action type thing, right? We need to walk, we need to move. I did sing the song, These Boots Were Made for Walking in the first service, and they didn't laugh. <laughs> See that? I didn't say it this time, and you did laugh. That's good. But it also requires discipline, going against the grain of what my flesh wants, trusting in God during those times. Because peace isn't like an I have arrived moment and then we're just kind of in it. It's constant, a constant awareness to actively pursue it. So you got to keep working at trying to show that to others. So third question, what do I do with peace? If I know I want it, I know how to get it, what do I do with it? Psalm 4.8 says, I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. And I'm not going to say that we just sleep and that's it. But no, the Lord wants us to rest in him alone through these tough times. But we can also show it to others. This is only if you have the peace inside of you that it can be emanated from you, in the light bulb analogy, to show to others. And that's especially in during, in t uh, during times of conflict. I think that it's most important to be able to show God's peace. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. So if you are God's son, then you should be called the peacemaker, and you'll be blessed for that. Romans 12, 18 says, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I kind of struggled with this one, um, especially the everyone part. I'm like, I don't want to live a peace with everyone. There's a lot of people at work I don't, and I hope you're not listening. But I, I'm like, ah, uh, how about, but it says, as far as it depends on me. As far as it depends on me. And that's pretty much everything in my life. I need to show peace to others and live at peace with people. Jesus did this well. If you remember the story in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he had just, um, he was uh, going to be taken to trial ultimately, and he was just had, it was in a severe anguish and anxiety. He had just sweat blood, knowing what he was about to go against. And then a mob of people came, right? Judas had betrayed him. A mob of people came to t arrest him. And we pick up in Luke 22, 49 through 51. It says, when those around him saw what was going to happen, they asked, Lord, should we strike with a sword? 
Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. But Jesus responded, no more of this. And touching his ear, he healed him. You see, Jesus didn't have to do that. He didn't have to be a peacemaker at that time. But he did. He did. So how do I tie this all together? Right? You might be asking yourself, how, how do we put this together? How do I put peace in my life? All right, I'm sitting here today. There is a lot of conflict in my life or pain or suffering. How do I make it work? Well, I think looking at the lives of others who've gone before us is a good example of that in a good way and a good tool. So I want to jump into the story of Joseph from the Old Testament. Now, Joseph, if you know your Bible, was um, well-loved by his father, not much, so much by his brothers who ultimately sold him into slavery because they were jealous of his beautiful colored coat. Um, I used Technicolor dream coat in the last service and they didn't laugh at that either. <laughs> I wasn't doing well. But he ultimately was sold to Potiphar as a servant in his house. And we all know, well, if you know the story, we know that Potiphar's wife started to seduce David and David didn't want anything to do with that. So then she quickly flipped the coin on that and said, hey, he tried to seduce me and he ended up in prison. And so Genesis 39 Verse 21 kicks off to where Joseph is now in prison. It says, But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and the Lord made everything that he did successful. So to kind of read between the lines, it doesn't say anything that Joseph was at peace or Joseph experienced God's peace, but Joseph, we know, was in a foreign land. Joseph, we know, was thrown in prison. Joseph, we know, probably thought his life was on the line for what he was um, charged with doing. But we do know that the Lord was with him, and he knew that. And we do know that Joseph ultimately found favor with the guard, where he gave him some things to do. So... To me, looking at this story, I could only surmise that Joseph kind of exhibited that peace and wasn't in a conflict-type arrangement with, within the prison. Um, I don't know if I would have acted in a way to be able to get rights to start to do stuff, but Joseph did. So the next story I want to talk to you about is a story that hits a lot closer to our Groton Bible Chapel home. And before I... Uh, talk a little bit on that. I wanted to show you one thing. My name is Gwen Depot. I've been going to Groton Bible for almost four years. My husband Joel was diagnosed with cancer in September of 2016. He had been having symptoms for almost two years and we couldn't figure out what they were and uh, we finally got a doctor who would listen to us, found out that he had a brain tumor. Uh, he had surgery in the fall of 2016 and radiation that winter. He was doing pretty well for about a year and a half after that until July of 2018 we had um, a bad scan and then the second scan following that showed that the tumor was growing and uh, that he needed surgery again. After the second surgery, we decided to um, have him do immunotherapy. Uh, from the very beginning, Joel was against doing chemotherapy. Um, he didn't want to sacrifice healthy time with his family for a couple months more that it might possibly give him. Both the surgeries were pretty easy to recover from, but after the second one, he started having uh, a lot more symptoms, seizures and rashes and confusion. We continued with the immunotherapy until uh, into March of 2019 when they told us there was nothing else that they could do. We got a second opinion that confirmed it and he, he passed away in May of 2019. So we, we got the call from the neurologist and I think the first thing we kind of wrestled with was all the practical things. Right away, we uh, contacted Joel's family. He wanted to tell everyone at once. So we had them all come over and uh, Joel told them all together. And 
I think that that was like the hardest thing that he had to do. Yeah, that's right. Not because he was upset or mad, but he felt bad for them. He was sad for everyone else. Don't do that. Don't poke the cake. Yeah, the less you poke it, the better. <laughs> You're gonna use the back side to spread it. Yeah, like that. And then, like that. After it kind of settled in, one of the first things we, we both felt, actually, and Joel more so than I, was relief. He was relieved because we had couldn't figure out what was wrong. He also felt relieved that he had some sort of purpose or he felt like it would lead to some sort of purpose. We made so many good friends because people were always coming around and we got to know some people so much better. They got to see that Joel was at peace with everything. And I think that the more that happened, it was almost like that was like a goal of his to show more and more people, to see more and more people so that they could see that he, he was at peace and he was okay. After Joel passed, I actually found a whole bunch of notes in his phone, and so many of them had to do with um, his purpose and that God would use uh, his sickness to show people um, that you can be ill but still be godly, that you can still have a good life, that you can get through trials and um, still be a loving person. There are many, many instances where he would just pray for that over and over again, that people would see that um, God was still with him. He really focused on that, on how he could be at peace and be just an example to people of how, hey, how yet. God can love you through your trials and you can still be hey. Um, hey. at peace with everything and okay. Hey. I think that it did make people realize that you, you don't have to focus on the sadness of everything, that you can still enjoy things while they're here. He was doing a study of the, the verse where uh, Jesus says, you know, if you're willing, take this cup from me. He found comfort in the fact that even Jesus felt that way. Joel would really want people to know that uh, he had a great life and that he wasn't meant to be here for longer. In a lot of the notes on his phone, there was a theme um, of being very grateful. And over and over again, he wrote that he was so grateful that he had such a good life and that he was at peace with whatever uh, God's plan was for him. So what can we learn from Joel Depot's life? I took six things away uh, from this and in talking with Gwen, his wife, on how he lived out the, rest, the, the last moments of his life. And we know that Joel had peace during his sickness. That was apparent. He was relieved because he felt as though through this he had purpose and Gwen had shared with me that before he got sick, he was kind of questioning what his purpose was in life and what God wanted him to do. And when he got sick, as she mentioned, he finally realized that it was this. Joel also was excited that people got to see that he was at peace with all this. And that was his goal, was to show Christ to others through his peace. He also wanted to show that you can still be ill, but have a good life. And this was his prayer. You see, I don't know what you're going through today, whether it's loss, heartache, 
sickness. You don't need to be sad, but you can have God's peace in you and find that joy that he wants you to have. Joel focused on being at peace and being an example of how God can still love you through these trials, and he truly felt God's love, and that's apparent. Joel also knew that Jesus felt exactly what he felt, and that gave him comfort. Joel understood that his Savior was hung on the cross for our sins. He was beaten, he was whipped, he was mocked. He knew pain, and he knew that death was coming. And Joel rested in the fact that his Savior knew that. You see, Joel's theme was gratefulness for a great life and that he was at peace with whatever God's plan was for him. He knew that during all things, he was to glorify God. Therefore, the fruit of peace was not only used for him to know and rest in God during this time, but to be used after he has gone to be with the Lord and to be a testimony to others, you and I, today. You see, it's also this peace that Jesus freely gives us. I'm going to reread John 14, 27. It says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. See, Jesus left us peace. He said these words before he went up, back up to his Father in heaven. So it was kind of a will, if you will, for our lives. But in leaving us peace, he left us himself. Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6 says he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Without Jesus, we wouldn't have peace. Because Jesus' whole life was a reflection of peace. And he is promising us that if we have him in our lives, we will have peace. Let me leave you with one last statement today. Peace is not just in Jesus. Peace is is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I don't know the hearts of the people that are in this room today, but I do know that there's a lot of hearts that are hurting, a lot of hearts that are in conflict, a lot of hearts that are in pain and trial and fear. And Lord, you promise your own, that you would be with us, that you would never leave us and never forsake us, that you would give us that perfect peace so that it could be a light inside of us, but it also can be a light around us. And Father, I think of the people that are here today that may not know you as their Savior, and if you're one of those today, can I encourage you to ask a friend who may have brought you, or me, or Gary, or Zach, or anyone else on staff, what it means to have Jesus in your heart. Because without that, you won't experience true peace. Father, I pray that you would open the hearts now of people. Their ears have been opened. Would you open their hearts and let them take this in? In your name I pray, amen. Would you stand with us? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when so.
Jesu. 